Hi, welcome back to McClutchy Maths. My name is Natalie McClutchy and today we're going to be talking about piecewise and step graphs. These are two special kinds of graphs that you may learn about as part of a unit on linear equations, perhaps in grade 10, but definitely in grade 11 if you are in year 11 general maths in Queensland. It's part of unit one. So there are some prerequisite knowledges that you need to have, some skills that you should be fairly competent with before you undertake learning how to do a piecewise or a step graph. Firstly, you need to be familiar with the symbology greater than or less than. Secondly, you need to be able to solve simultaneous equations using the substitution method. That's the method we're going to be showing in this video. You may also want to brush up on that a little bit more by looking at my um, unit on simultaneous equations with the substitution and the elimination method, which is in the playlist um, about algebra. The next skill you need to be able to use is to be able to graph using a table of values or using the gradient and y-intercept method. So basically you need to be able to take the information from the equations and graph them or sketch them. So I'm going to show both these methods in this video, but I'm going to go through it fairly quickly. So I'm assuming you already know how to do that. So let's talk a little bit about what a piecewise graph is. It's formed when we join two or more linear graphs together. That's another way of saying we're going to join two or, th or, or more equations within certain domains. So these are all going to be linear equations in this case. And they are graphs when they join together that we have no breaks between the different equations as they're graphed. So it's one continuous line from infinity to negative infinity, but it just changes directions along the way. So let's look at an example of a piecewise graph. In this particular example, we've got three different equations joining to form one continuous long line. Now the first part is shown over here. Now that's within the domain that all values of x are less than one. So you can see that goes all the way to negative infinity for x values. The next part of the line is a horizontal line and that's made up of all x values between one and six. And the last part of this graph, our domain, is all x values greater than 6. So when you see the symbology greater than, less than, that's going to be explained on these particular graphs. Okay, so let's have a look with a worked example. We're going to do a fairly simple one, two straight lines. The first one is y is equal to 3x plus 6. Our domain is x values are going to be less than or equal to a and y is equal to 2x minus 2 and all our x values are going to be greater than a. Now you may be wondering, I haven't seen a before, I know y equals mx plus c but I've never seen a. Well a just represents the unknown number where our x values on our two lines are going to have in common. So when we find the value for x by solving simultaneously we've actually found the value of a. So let's start by solving simultaneously. Firstly we're going to name our equations equation 1 and equation 2. That's fairly logical, you should know how to do that already. And that's just all about our communication. Now, if we've got y is equal to one thing and y is equal to another thing, then those two things are also going to be equal to one another because they both are equal to y. So if that didn't make sense, it'd be a good idea to pause and have a bit of a think about that and a bit of reflection because both of them are equal to the same value y, which we're trying to work out what that y is. So therefore, 3x plus 6 is equal to 2x minus 2. Now we can solve this because we only have one variable and that variable is x. So let's bring 2x to the other side where the 3x is by subtracting 2x from both sides. We've now got x plus 6 equals negative 2. And we can bring our other like terms, our whole numbers together by subtracting x, um, 6 from both sides and we end up with x is equal to negative 8. So this is our x coordinate, we've effectively found a. Now we're going to substitute this into equation 2. I always choose the equation that's got the easiest numbers. So in this case, the smaller numbers are in equation 2. So if we substitute in x is equal to negative 8, we've got 2 times negative 8 take away 2, which is negative 16 take away 2, which gives us a value for y of negative 18. So what we've effectively done now is we've found where the two lines intersect and the coordinates of that intersection point is negative 8 and negative 18. And what we're going to do from here is we are going to graph the line. Now, I realise that we've got a little mistake there. It should say negative 18, but the coordinates are negative 8, negative 18. And we're going to substitute where we've seen a in our original domains. We're going to use um, negative 8 wherever we see the letter a. So now we know what our domains are for graphing. 
Okay, so we're going to sketch our piecewise graph. I'm going to show you two methods to sketch. You don't have to use two different methods when you're doing it. I'm just demonstrating two different methods and you choose the one that you prefer to graph both graphs. So for equation one, I'm going to use a table of coordinates. Now I've chosen four values for x, negative 8, negative 2, 0 and 2. The reason I chose negative 8 is that's my intersection point. So I want to make sure that that intersection point is definitely going to be a point that I pass through. So I'll make sure that that's definitely happening. Now I've chosen negative 2, 0 and 2 because it's nice to just have numbers that are evenly spaced around the origin for graphing purposes. As it turns out, when I substitute negative 2 into that first equation, so just work with me, 3 times negative 2 is negative 6 plus 6 more gives me 0. What I've effectively found here is my x-intercepts. So that's going to be really nice as well for me to graph that. It was just coincidence that that turned out that way. When I substitute 0 in, I find 6, and that of course is the y-intercept. And then the next value is 2. 2 times 3 is 6, plus 6 more gives me 12. So now I've got four points. Now technically speaking, you only need two points to draw a graph. However, sometimes it's nice to have a couple more just to make sure our line is in the exact perfect position. Um, sometimes when you're using two dots, depending on how big you draw your dots, it's easy to miss the center of that dot and to be a little bit skew if with it. So now we're going to plot our points onto a Cartesian plane. So I'm going to start with my point of intersection, which is negative 8, 8, negative 18. Then I'm going to put on my x-intercept, my y-intercept, and my last point, which was 2, 12. So now I've got four lovely points to pass my line straight through all of those. So we're done for our first equation. Now it's time to plot our second equation. I'm going to use for this one the gradient and y-intercept method. So firstly, let's inspect our equation. Here is our y-intercept. I've circled that. It's negative 2. So this is where we cut the y-axis. So I'm going to plot that point in red on the y-axis. Now this is the next part where some people will make a mistake and it's, it's an easy mistake to make if you don't understand how linear equations actually work. A lot of people think that we're going to rise and run with our gradient. Here's our gradient 2. They think we rise and run from the origin which is the point 0, 0. And that is not correct. We always rise and run from our y-intercept because we know our y-intercept is definitely on the line. So we always calculate our gradient from a point that we have. Now, every whole number is a fraction over 1. So our rise is going to be 2. And that's going to take us to the origin, coincidentally. And we're going to run 1. So our next point runs out to 1. Now, it's very important that you don't rise and run from a point that's not on your line because here's where our line is here. If I'd done a rise and run from the origin, 0, 0, then I would end up in a completely different spot. And the origin is not on either of these lines. So it doesn't make sense to calculate gradient from a point that's not on the line. Okay, that's enough of that lecture. Let's have a look now at how we work out which parts of our graph we're going to erase because we actually only need two parts. We could have the V part in the corner, we've got the upside down V in the bottom corner, we've got the very wide open V this way and a very wide open V that way. So there's four different ways we could create this piecewise graph depending on how we interpret the domain of X values. So looking at our first equation, every value of X is less than or equal to negative 8. So what we need to do is go along our X axis and find the number negative 8 and obviously that's our point of intersection that we found. So every value of x is going to be um, smaller than negative 8. So that means we need all of the numbers from negative 8 to negative infinity included in our orange line. And that's why we rub out the top part of the line because that's all our positive numbers for x and they are not included. Now let's look at our second line, the red line. This means every value of x is going to be greater than negative 8. So that means negative 7 all the way up to zero, all the way up to positive infinity is going to be included in our red line. So that means we don't need the little bit at the bottom. We've now created our piecewise graph. So this is probably the most complex part of this piece of work is interpreting that symbology correctly and understanding it. A good way to go back is just to test reality by picking a number like zero, for example, it's easy to find x equals zero, our origin, and ask yourself, is x less than 0? Zero? 0 is 0 less than negative 8? 
Well, no, it's not. Zero is greater than negative eight. So that helps you with that first equation work out that zero, where zero is for an X value, is not going to be on that line. And same with the bottom one. You could put zero. Is it greater than negative eight? Um, yes, it is. So therefore, the red line will include an X value of zero in its part or its domain. Okay, let's have a quick look now at step graphs. So they're a little bit like a piecewise graph. They're formed again from two or more linear graphs, but this time they have a zero gradient. That means they're all horizontal. And because all the parts of this graph are horizontal, they are looking like a bit of a step, they're all parallel lines. Each graph is going to have a defined starting point and an ending point. That means they don't have arrows into infinity like your typical linear graph but the only exception might be your very last line or your very first line if they incorporate all values into infinity. So we'll have a look at that with a concrete example and it will make more sense in a moment. So here's an example of a step graph. We've got three parts to this step graph. We've got the bottom line in blue. Notice that it's got that open circle on the left hand side and the closed circle on the right hand side. And we'll talk a little bit about that, bit about that in a moment. But notice that where the first line finishes at negative four, that's where the next line starts um, directly above it and continues on with no breaks in between. Notice our last point doesn't have an arrow into infinity because clearly there's no values that are going to be greater than nine for x. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about those circles on the ends of the lines that define the intervals. Remember from probably grade nine maths, or even grade 10 maths, that that open circle means greater than or less than. And a colored in circle or a closed circle means greater than or equal to or less than and equal to. Now this becomes important because what this is saying, for example, with the green line, let's have a look at that. That's saying that all the X values are going to be greater than five or less than and equal to nine. So that's very important that we understand what that means because if we're talking about things like charges for someone's business, it's important to know what how to interpret the graph correctly. So let's look at this with a more concrete example and hopefully this will become really clear for you. Now a lot of the textbooks use examples of car park charges. For example, Westfields typically don't charge for the first three hours and then the next hour is four dollars and so on. So there's like the pricing goes up in steps. And often businesses and tradespeople will charge out in much the same way. So we're going to look at an example here of a plumber who is charging the following rates for his services per day. Up to one hour, he will charge $50. Notice he's not going to charge for zero work. From one hour all the way up to, but not including three hours, he'll charge $120 and so on. So we want to create a step graph that represents this information. Now, the best thing to do first is to create some inequality equations. So we're going to create those to match the information. So firstly, what this is saying is that the charge will be $50 on the y-axis. 50 is on the y-axis. You can see cost there on the graph. For all values greater than zero and not all the way up to one hour, but not including that hour mark, they'll be $50. For the next charge, it'll be $120. That's our next step up. For all the charges from $1, including, sorry, one hour, including one hour, all the way up to, but not including three, and so on. So we've created our four inequalities. And now it's time to graph them. So firstly, I'm gonna draw in my first one. So I'm gonna be drawing a horizontal line with two open circles on either end. That's gonna be from zero to one hour. Notice on the y-axis, I've got my cost, and that's approximately around the $50 mark there. Now I'm gonna draw in my second um, line. Remember, once again, horizontal line. So go directly above your second circle and put in a closed circle this time, all the way out to the three hour mark, approximately, and leave an open circle on that end, and so on with the next line that's gonna be also horizontal and parallel, and the fourth one, it's a much bigger step that one because it goes all the way from five hours to 11 hours. Now notice this time we've got um, less than or equal to 11 hours and we've inserted that as part of our inequality because if he does exactly 11 hours, well that clearly is the most the plumber is going to charge and he's clearly not working more than 11 hours, that's his maximum for the day. Well that's all we have time for today. I hope this has been helpful to you. I hope this has helped you with simultaneous equations. Please like and subscribe to the channel and I look forward to hearing your comments. Have a great day.